Welcome one and all to uh, today's webinar. Um, as Christine said, my name is Andre Duhaney and I am the product owner for the Caseware Monitor, the Caseware AML Compliance Solution. So in today's webinar, we'll be talking um, more specifically about regulator reporting as it relates to the version 5.4.1 release that was done about a month and a half ago and the focus was around e-filing upgrades. So before I uh, delve into the, the, the um, specifics around regulator reporting, I just want to do a quick overview of the case for AML platform because the platform in itself provides a lot of different functionality, not just the regulator reporting. So we're talking about customer due diligence, where we're doing list screening during the onboarding process, or we are screening the senders and the receivers on transactions, identity, identity verification, risk profiling, etc. Then we also have the transaction monitoring piece in which we are looking for suspicious activities or suspicious transactions. And later on, this will filter into the regulator reports that are being filed with the different regulators. So we're talking about identifying structured transactions or any transactions that are above a particular threshold, so on and so forth. We also have fraud detection we are looking for anomalies and we're using link analysis as well as a, a mix of rules-based analysis, analysis. We also have advanced analytics capabilities within the application, within the tool. So predictive link analysis, rules engine, scoring engine, as well as profile anomaly. These are just some of the, the different um, types of uh, analytics that we're running. And then on top of that is the robust and powerful case management and workflow function within the application. So this is a flexible workflow um, from different organizations. You can customize the workflow to match your mediation process. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go on. But for today's webinar, the, the, the focus is around regulator reporting. So on the agenda, we'll be talking about the GoML reporting capabilities in terms of from an overall perspective. And then we will talk a little bit about the specific changes that were made in version 5.4.1 as it relates to GoML. We also added support for another uh, region, Dominican Republic, and it was just a single report at the STR. I'll show you that as well. And a big update for the 5.4.1 release was the FinCEN CTR reports. Also, to end off the presentation, we will talk about virtual customer ID for, for MSBs. And this is quite important for MSBs and um, non-traditional organizations or financial institutions. So GoML, this um, was really put together by the United Nations um, Department on Drugs. And it's really to help uh, jurisdictions to gather and, and process these reports in a meaningful and seamless way. So they have put together this schema that um, is being used by a lot of different countries across the globe. So how do we help this process or improve this process? So with GoML and with all other reports, what we're doing, we're detecting, first detecting the suspicious activity. So if to, in, in a typical situation before we had all, this, an, all these analytic tools to process the data, then persons would have to be sitting down and looking through tons of data to identify suspicious activity. However, through our process, we are automating that and we are automatically detecting where uh, a transaction has exceeded the threshold or some, something suspicious might have happened. So we first detect and then we aggregate the data. This is quite important because in these reports, if you have seen any of these reports, whether it be GoML, FinCEN reports, they require a lot of different information. Information such as the customer, around the customer, the their, their IDs, their date of birth, where they, their address, also where the transaction took place, 
information around the entity, meaning the business that is filing the report, the, the transaction date, and all of that jazz. So this is quite a, a bit of information that has to be collected and put together in a particular format. So we are doing all of that aggregation to take the workload of the compliance staff. So once the aggregation is done, what Caseware Monitor or Caseware, the Caseware AML compliance solution does is to auto-populate or auto-complete the, the, the SDR and TTR reports. So the threshold transaction reports and the suspicious transaction reports. So automatically filling out each field and making sure that the requirements are met so that someone does not have to sit at their desk and key in this information because this is quite time consuming and a, a, a tedious task. The next thing we are doing is validating the, the reg reports to make sure that all the different requirements, the field requirements are being met. So for example, if you entered for a customer an, a piece of identification like a passport, the, the report may have conditional fields that will ask for the, the, the related passport number. Or in some instances, the national identification, uh, it, it requires a nine digit number. And in the report, they are valid, we are validating against that. So what we have done is we have taken all the requirements from the regulators and we have built that into our reports so that we won't have a situation where you are submitting reports to the regulators and then they are being rejected because the rules weren't met or the reports are not in the correct format. And finally, we are generating the XML or generating the reports. So with most of these regulators, what we have found and with GoML is that they are taking the reports in a particular format. And for GoML, it's, it's, it's XML and the, the, they have provided us the schema and we have taken that schema and we are making sure that we are exporting the report in that particular schema so that it's not being rejected by the, the FIU's um, servers. So that's around the generation of the XML and this can be done in batches so you don't necessarily have to select one report at a time to submit, you can submit a batch of reports. And later on in the during the demo, um, uh, Benjamin will go through some of that. So that's just a quick synopsis of the GoML reporting functionality that we have. So once that done, that's done with the GoML, the user can submit the XML via a, a portal. So they have a web portal that persons can log into and uh, submit the reports. For some other um, uh, regulators, they have different applications that can be used to submit these reports automatically. So that's the overview of the GoML reports. Um, in terms of the 5.4.1 release, we made some changes to update the reports based on updates that were done by the regulator. So they, they made a few changes in regards to some particular fields like uh, country, state, they introduced the passport and for the passport you have to supply a passport number. So we had to update the validation to make sure that once persons submit the reports, they will not be rejected because these fields are not being validated properly or filled out. So that's the GoAML schema updates for version 5.4.1. And then we have expanded the, the, the compliance in terms of region. So we, in this release, we introduced the DOMREP SDR reports. And as you can see, the report is in Spanish. And the similar to the GoML process, that's the same thing that we're doing with these DOMREP reports. We are detecting the suspicious activities, aggregating the data, and we're pre-populating the reports just to reduce the workload for the compliance department. And after that, persons can submit the reports to the regulator. So that's it for the DOMREP reports. So now moving on to the FinCEN CTR updates. 
Um, so for FinCEN, what was done is FinCEN, with their reports for their CTR and their SAR reports, they are doing a phase base, a phase update in terms of they are moving away from ASCII or what we call sometimes called fixed width files that um, reports are being submitted, in which report are being reports are being submitted and. Uh, we had to make sure that we updated our reports because FinCEN provided a deadline which was June 1st and we had to make sure that the software was ready by or before that that deadline so that persons will not be um, hampered because at, as, as of June 1st they are not accepting the ASCII files it's just the straight XML files so we had to make some updates to the software to handle that. In addition to the the output file, there are a few fields that were introduced in different sections of the report. And the first one is in part one, which is the person involved in the transactions. This was the item 2D courier service. If you're uh, use of the report it was re um, replaced or renamed to common carrier for part two amount and type of transaction they added a checkbox uh, to reflect the shared branching and then part three transaction location this is where the transaction took place um, they added an unknown checkbox for for the EIN so if you don't know if the customer does not have that piece of information then they can actually select the unknown checkbox and then part four is an actually brand new section in which they're con collecting information or contact information from the institution so that while they are um, if in a case when they're reviewing the reports they need some clarification about some so a piece of information they can contact someone at, at the institution so in a nutshell that's it for the CTR updates this here is just a screenshot of the CTR report in case we're monitoring and you can see that we highlighted one of the changes that were made with the field some other regulator reporting um, announcements the we we looked at automating the the file attachments so for suspicious activity reports as it relates to FinCEN you have the ability to attach a file with a bunch of transactions to to provide additional information to the reports that are being submitted that can be done within case or monitor reports can also be printed and they can also be exported to the requisite file for submission and on top of that we have full traceability or audit trail within the application to capture all the actions that are taken during the remediation or the preparation of the report so if if a person has a comment or an attachment or they performed a workflow action all of those things are being logged in addition to that there are state assignments um, so who are the persons that are supposed to be receiving these reports at a particular state notifications of deadlines so if there's someone on in the compliance team or on the team that has had the report for um, a, a, an extended period of time or you have provided a deadline then once that deadline or turnaround time expires then a notification can be sent out or the, the report will be flagged as overdue in addition to that the workflow has additional intelligence or we can configure it in such a way that if an item becomes overdue then it can be escalated to someone else to take care of it because in a situation where someone is on vacation then you may need to handle that report in such a way in addition we can also lock different states in the workflow so for example if you are preparing your reports at state A and B, you've worked the report, made all the changes that you want and you think that the report is ready to go and you have moved it to the submit state in the workflow, then you may want to lock down the reports at the submit state so persons cannot make any further changes. 
So I have a few screenshots. So this screenshot just shows you how the configuration is done of, uh, in terms of the states. So here, this is a simple workflow that we have. These are just the workflow states. However, you can mark the states that you deem to be editable. And you can also select the submit state. So persons can only submit or generate the batch of report from this particular state in the workflow, meaning they can only export the report for submission at this point in the workflow. And the reason for that is we have to put some control around it to ensure that the reports are being validated before the, they are being exported for submission to ensure that these reports were properly prepared or reviewed and they do not contain any errors. Because once you submit the reports to the regulator, the expectation is that the reports are up to date and they are properly filled out. We also have the accepted and rejected states um, for regulators that, like FinCEN, that um, provide an acknowledgement file when a report is submitted, these acknowledgement files contain information regarding whether or not the reports were accepted successfully or they were rejected for some particular reason. What we can do is actually drop those acknowledgement files in a location on the server and case your monitor automatically reads the content of the acknowledgement files and moves the report the related report to a particular state. So for example, if the reports, if the acknowledgement files came back and it says, and, and it says that the reports were all accepted without errors, then we would move the report automatically to an accepted state within the workflow. Here's a quick example of the workflow. So we have different states within the workflow. We, so the boxes are what we call states and the lines are actually the actions that persons, that the team members will actually perform. So you can move the work, the report from the assigned state to the ready to submit state, which is in this example is the state at which you will be submitting the reports. And then we have the rejected and filed with regulator states if the reports were accepted without errors and so on and so forth. Benjamin will go into that a little bit more in the, the demo. Lastly, I just wanted to touch a little bit on the virtual customer IDs that, um, that, that, that can be used and, and, and the reason for this, this virtual customer ID. And this is more for non-traditional uh, businesses or financial institutions that does not necessarily have the concept of a uh, of an entity in terms of a customer. So and in an MSB situations, persons, they will just come to the, go to the agent or the MSB on a random basis and uh, send transfers back home. So there may not necessarily be a unique way to identify each of these customers. And this, why is it important to uniquely identify these customers, you may be asking yourself. The thing is, if you want to be submitting regulator reports or you are being tasked by the regulators to submit regulator reports, um, for example, in a, in a structuring transaction, to report structuring tra transactions, if customer A walks in and, you, and, and they are splitting up the transaction into five different uh, transactions across different uh, agents, you need to be able to identify customer A across all those five transactions. So that you will see that the aggregate amount on those five transactions actually exceeded the threshold. In that situation, you will be required to submit a, a, a currency transaction report or a threshold transaction report. So that is kind of why it's very important to be able to uniquely identify the customers across the, the, the organization. So in this example here, in case we're monitor, we're using fuzzy matching to identify the customers and to, to, to actually create that unique ID. So in the example, Stacey Valdez may go to agent one and the information that she's providing is a little bit different from the information that she provides at agent two. So the, you'll notice that the 
the first record says the address is 234 Broad, Broadview Circle, and the second one says 234 Broadview Road, while the third one does not have an address. So how are we certain that this is the Stacey Valles? And also, Stacey Valles is spelled differently for the, for the third record. By the use of fuzzy matching, we can actually look at the data through analysis and detect that this is a 95% chance that this is the Stacey Valdez and create a unique customer ID for Stacey Valdez. That's pretty much it from a presentation standpoint. I am now going to hand over to my colleague Benjamin who will walk you guys through the demonstration. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, Andre. Um, so I'm ready just to keep the demonstration portion. Um, so Andre, what I wanted to show with you and um, with the rest of the people with us is case for monitor. So for those of you who are not familiar with the tool, uh, as you can see here, it is a web-based application. It is uh, an application that can be deployed uh, on-premise or in the cloud. And as you can see here also, we can manage security very granular. That means that we can assign, for example, who needs to have access to what portions of the information. In this area, we can assign, for example, the type of roles if I'm allowed to be or to see some portions of the information to edit or maybe just not able to see during the remediation process. So we can control exactly who has access to what type of information. So that is something very important that I wanted to mention. Andre, uh, something very important also in here, and which is the skeleton of the solution, is the workflow. As you just mentioned, the workflow in here creates an automation process in the tool. So think about Case World Monitor as the exception management form framework. Right, so where you can uh, manage all your exceptions and all your alerts. So let me show you uh, something very interesting here. Where we see on the left side, those are the business processes. So those are the exceptions that we want to uh, to identify. Again, this can be identified based based on a, a batch mode or even in real in real time. Okay, so we can identify that. So if we want to, for example, monitor transaction or monitor any type of suspicious activities, we can monitor and flag those in real time or maybe by the end of the day, by the end of the week, every other day. So that gives us that flexibility into identifying those type of actions. Now, what you see on the right side is the exceptions. So once we identify exactly the thresholds, exactly exactly the type of actions we want to identify, we will be reflecting those on the right side. So, for example, in this case, we see currency transaction reports, okay? But what I wanted to show you is the workflow capabilities. Right from here, we can automate the process. We can automate the triggering the process on creating and filing a, a, a currency transaction report, for example. So what you see here, is the workflow, the representation of the business process. Now, every customer will be different. So the business process for the remediation for, uh, for filing a report will be different. And this will be adjusted to those type of business processes. Okay, so- Benjamin, just, just yeah. one quick question. Um, can the users make these changes them themselves or do they have to depend on an implementation specialist? That is a great question, Andre. So, as you can see here, these are states and transitions, and it looks like drag and drop. So, to answer your question, Andre, uh, the customer can do this on their own. We can help and provide some uh, assistance at the very beginning on the implementation, but they can do this on the go. So, they can change, create new transitions, create new states, so they can adapt the workflow and the process the way that they need. Awesome. Okay. So, once we... Uh, understand this, uh, the workflow, the process, how we actually interact with the tool, we're gonna uh, now review one of the cases. So for this particular case, an example, uh, I wanna review one particular report that was generated for Andrew Johnson with an aggregation amount of $15,000, right? So what we're gonna see on the right side is exactly those exceptions and that representation of the report. So let me show you exactly that, because now we have the ability to, because maybe, uh, Andre, what would be the most, uh, probably the, the biggest challenge that you have when filing a, a, a report? 
it's actually detecting the suspicious activity in the first place and then the process of filling out the reports and making sure that the reports are properly filled out that's the, the hardest part because some of these reports have you know up to a hundred fields that you know that you, you may need to put in some information and that's quite tedious and hard to sit down and do something like that and I have good news for you, Andre. So the first thing is that we can, again, trigger this automatically. That means that we can capture or generate the exceptions and trigger the, the, the filing of the report. The second portion of it is that we can actually help to auto-populate the report for you. That will save up to probably 80% of the time for filing a report. So let me show you that because it's very interesting. Now, what you see here is a series of, the, of uh, currency transaction reports that I have created in here and have been assigned for on um, some sort to, to me, right? So you see here, there's different states. There are some that have been assigned and some other have been ready for submission. Things that I would like to emphasize in here is that we can um, create a report, we can find a report, we can submit that report immediately, but we can also save those reports, several reports, for example, by the end of the day, and upload those in batch mode. And we also support third-party tools, like for example, IBM Direct, to upload those reports. Okay, so that's also something very interesting that I'd like to, that, that I wanted to mention. So let's uh, review one of these reports. For example, um, this uh, report that we have in here, if we open the report or view the report, um, notice something here. So you have all the information that is being pulled from the transaction and from the alert. So exactly the name of the customer, all the information that is coming from the specific transaction, what is actually uh, originating that specific uh, transaction. Okay, and that's the feeling of the report. Now, another interesting uh, thing that I'd like to mention here is that we have the option to validate the report. When we validate the report, as you can see it here, this allows us to have complete control on the report. So that means that, for example, if we're missing some information, if we're putting some illegal characters, for example, it won't allow us to, to move forward on the submission process because it will do a validation right before this process. And at the moment that it's really ready to submission, we can just uh, do that por um, process as well. So for example, we have reviewed this, this particular report. And the next action, for example, will be, okay, it is now ready for submission. When it's ready for submission, remember the states and the transitions, it is exactly in here. So it is reflected in here where we can take those type of actions based on the workflow. And in here, what I'm doing is I'm moving this report into the state ready for submission. Who's gonna be assigned or who's gonna be in control for that next step or next state will be uh, this user or maybe a specific team, okay? Then I do the assignment and I can also add some additional attachments, or any additional information. When I do that, notice that it will change the, um, the status or the state for this particular report. At this point, the report will be ready. So now, if I take, for example, several reports that are ready to submission, I will be able to actually submit the report directly into the, uh, uh, into the organization that needs to receive those reports, okay? Now, let me show you something also in here. Uh, as you mentioned uh, during your presentation, Andre, um, the customer virtual ID. So that is a very um, common type of a challenge whenever there is no um, a unique identifier. So what I would like to show you here is exactly how we can actually use a, an ID as the identifier for the same customer. So again, we may don't have a unique identifier, but in the tool, we can use this as a unique identifier. So let me show you that. So if we view the report, and if we navigate, for example, in this particular case, uh, let's try to find, um, some information that we would like to use. So we we can use, for example, and let me take another example here. We can use 
a, let's say, a tax ID number, and that tax ID number can be used as the unique identifier. So let's let's show that in just a second. So right from here, <clears throat> we have the information, and we can take that uh, uh, identifier to do the same type of report. So, and we do that, for example, in the same way as with suspicious reports. So with the suspicious activity reports, we do the same capabilities where we can actually create exceptions, generate the report, same thing as we see it in here. Remember, it can be generated or triggered uh, from an exception and generate the report right from here. We can do the same thing, view a report, submit a report, or save it to, the, to do the submission as a batch mode. Right from here, Okay, so pretty much, Benjamin, we we're saying that um, across different uh, scenarios or alerts, we can identify the same customer through the unique identifier. That is correct. So what we can do is, for example, creating that. So in this particular case, we have uh, in this customer, in this report, we have, let's say, uh, tax ID number. So we can use that exact tax ID number and let's say, for example, if I go into um, another type of alert, let's say, for example, store jumping, and notice that from here. So now we have, again, a series of exceptions right from here. But instead of having, for example, customer IDs, as we see in here, now we have the same transaction, the tax ID that we saw before, but we're using it as the customer ID. So if we double click on this, we're gonna be able to, that this customer, this ID number is related to the same customer, to Vidal Madison, the same customer that we saw during the report, okay? So that is the virtual customer ID that we can use just to generate this unique identifier. Now that I'm here, um, I would like to show you some of the case management capabilities. So again, uh, right from here, we have some uh, information that is pulling from the alert or the exception. In here, we just generate um, the exception and the details. So what is exactly the cause of this particular exception that was generated? We see that there's some type of information in here. Now, there's some additional actions uh, that we have available right from here. The actions, remember, those will depend based on the state that I'm located based uh, in the workflow. So in this particular case, I have the escalate or the close. Now, something very important to mention is uh, regarding the, the transitions in the workflow. So the transitions, I can do this, as we can see it in here, manually or automatically. That means that, for example, whenever I receive a, an alert, if it's, a, for example, for a report, so a submission of report, I can do that assignment automatically to a user. So for example, maybe all those uh, um, suspicious activity reports can be assigned to Andre. And then Andre will have pro probably, for example, let's say 24 hours to take some actions. If he doesn't take some actions, I can, create a rule just to escalate automatically those type of exceptions. So those transitions can be done manually or automatically. Okay. And, and to add to that, Benjamin, all of these actions that are taken, whether you're adding a comment, an attachment, or performing a workflow action is being recorded, right? That is a great question. And as you can see here on the right, we have the history. So that means that all the uh, interactions, everything that we do during the remediation process, so for example, when a compliance officer is uh, taking some actions uh, right from here, if we need to add, for example, a comment, notice that uh, there's a dialogue in here, and I can add a comment. So for example, Andre, we need more information. Now, for example, you may have some attachments, right? I may have some attachments to add. So for example, useful attachments, maybe, uh, I don't know, maybe an invoice, maybe a scan that I have in here. So I can provide those type of information in here. At the moment that I add the comment, notice that it will go into the history. So that means that every interaction that we do, okay? Every interaction that we do, it will go into the, into the history. 
Now, that history or that log will be always active. Even after the remediation process is done or finished, it will always be active or available for the users to, to, to review, okay? So the log will be always active. Okay, now, um, as we were reviewing here, the case management capabilities, <clears throat> We have, for example, this exception that we found that Viral Madison completed some transactions in three or more locations uh, in, for example, four uh, or less days. Now, I can take some actions right from here, and let's say, let's escalate this or transition this into the next state of the workflow or the remediation process right from here. And the next step, again, will be, for example, escalate. Or maybe if I have another one, let's say I would like to close it have some additional information from here to add, like for example, attachment as we saw before, or maybe indicators. These indicators will be always useful whenever there's additional information to provide, the, for example, the root cause. So I know that this particular uh, exception that we are seeing right now for Vidal Madison, maybe it's a human error, okay? So I can transition this into the next state and I can save this. So now we're moving this exception into the next state of the workflow. Okay, now, <clears throat> also right from here, we can generate. So we saw before that we can trigger automatically the exceptions and the filling or the creation of the, um, the reports. Right from here, right from this window, we can also create or file a new uh, SAR report. So right from here, it will be the option. So for example, if I enable that option in here, and again, as I mentioned before, we can create a new report, we can amend from an existing one, we can create this new SAR report, the information will be pulled from the transaction, and also remember the validation process that will make sure that we're not missing any information before we go or move into the next stage, we'll be ready for submission. So as you can see here, if I click fill for parameter, from parameters, this is exactly what you were uh, asking, Andre, a few minutes ago. So the ability just to uh, auto-populate the report for you to save some time, okay? Okay, let me just go back into, into the window from here. Okay, now we're back into the into the window. Uh, we're back into the case management tool. So remember, we're following the process into uh, remediate this particular exception. Uh, we have the ability to, to create a new SAR, create a new type of report, or maybe associate. So right from here, I can associate an existing case or an existing uh, work item into, an, in, in, into this new one that I just uh, found or that I'm working right now. So in this, area will be just ability to create that association. And also, if I have enough information right now for um, creating a new case in this particular area, I will be able to create a new case. Now, everything can be done automatically or manually. It all depends on how we define the rules. So remember that this is, an, uh, this is a tool that is rules-based. That means that we need to define the thresholds, we need to define the rules, and also the transitions from every single interaction during the process or the business, the business process for the remediation uh, process. When we do the, as we saw before, with the CTR reports or the customer transaction reports. So we generate those automatically. We can uh, review, validate, save, and then submit those reports. The same thing will go into the suspicious activity reports or any type of regulatory reports that we just need to uh, automatically generate. We can fill from the case management uh, capabilities or window that we saw before the submission of the report. That way we can automate most of the process. And also remember that the workflow will dictate exactly what is the remediation process that we need to, to follow in order to complete the, for example, the submission or the filing of a specific report. This is the, this is the, the, the area exactly, just to going back into the workflow where we can add the steps necessary in order to, to file a specific report. Okay, 
when we go back into the same case uh, uh, exceptions that we were reviewing before for the store jumping, we're going to be able to see that the state has been changed. So that's another way also just for me to have a to have a look exactly on the different states for the different assignments that I have on, on my end. Okay, so remember that we had before we have some uh, several uh, alerts assigned to me and the last one that we were working on now is in a different state which is in compliance review so if we go back into the workflow we see that now we have one exception moved into the compliance review state so this is another graphical representation exactly and to know what are the different um, exceptions that I have distributed on the different workflows. So in here, I know that now we have it in the compliance review. And finally, what I wanted to show you is also on the dashboard where I can have my working area. So this will be my working area where I can start my day and I see all my open items, all my assignments that I have ready. And something important to mention here is also the notifications. So whenever there is a notification, when it comes to, for example, uh, a report that was generated, a report that was uh, created or triggered, we can get a notification. So for example, is if Android, you need to be notified, uh, we can get you a notification via email, via the internal communication, as you see from here, you will be able to see, for example, how many open uh, items I need to work on during the, the, uh, the remediation process. Or if you prefer, we can also send you a notification over the phone through our S SMS uh, system. Oh, cool. So if there's a particular work item or alert that was generated and assigned to me, do I get a notification for that? That is correct. So we get a notification. You can get a notification. You or your team can get a notification. We just need to simply define if it's going to be via email or through the internal communication application or through an MS, SMS uh, message. But yes, you will get a notification. So you can manage all the alerts and send the notifications to the specific users. So whenever there's a transition, for example, if I move that, so if we remember, this particular case when we were moving or working on this particular exception for um, for this user when I move that into the next state of the workflow if that for example was assigned to you at that moment you will get a notification Andre okay okay so um, just as a summary right now what we saw today is um, the the interface of the application okay case we're monitored the security uh, we also review the ability to create and automate the process up to uh, probably an 80 percent of final report uh, currency transaction reports suspicious activity reports where we can trigger the creation of the report based on a type of transaction or based on a suspicious activities we can capture those again in real time or in batch mode generate and trigger the reports and then we can present the results or the exceptions to the cost to, to whoever needs to to do the remediation process so they can review we can also allow the out the pre-population of the report the validation of the report and the submission of the report we also support third-party tools to the submission of the report via um, uh, batch mode. We also uh, see here that if we group together different uh, reports that are ready for submission, again, we can do the submission right at the moment. And the same thing goes with SAR or suspicious activity reports. We can have the same type of uh, uh, identification uh, IDs, for example, as we saw in this example, the tax ID number, to be used as the virtual customer ID. So we know that is ref is referring to the same customer in different alerts, as we saw in this other scenario. For example, the store jumping, where we saw that Vidal, it is the same customer as we saw in the report, but now we see that there's another type of activity here, a suspicious activity, based on a series of transactions. So everything can be automated everything can be done uh, based on the workflow and also the automation process in real time on a batch mode 
All right. Thank you very much, Benjamin. That was a pretty good, very good um, and informative presentation there. My pleasure. Okay. So now we're just going to kind of wrap it up. Uh, Christine? So um, we actually had a few questions that have come in. Um, the first one is, can an analyst create an SAR report manually if they've witnessed a customer behaving suspiciously? Yes, definitely. And while we, you know, made pull out all the stops to make sure that we automate as much as possible the steps in the process, we are allowing persons to manually create SARs or SDRs because in some instances, someone may come into a branch and they may be asking or inquiring about the reporting threshold. That is actually something that you can report on. But in that instance, there isn't any data like transactions that took place that you're going to be reporting against. So the analytics would not be able to populate the report. So someone would be required like a customer services rep to create that report. So definitely that is that's functionality that's in the application. Okay. Um, and where does the information come from to populate the reports? Oh, nice. That's a pretty good question. Um, the information is really coming from the core systems. Um, in some instances, if the information does not reside in the core system, it can be filled out manually by, uh, by the analyst or the compliance team. But 95% of the time, the information is being pulled from the core system. So the customer database or the customer repository or our master data, then we have the transactional information that we're pulling and uh, populating the, the reports and information about the company itself that is also in the core systems that we can access. Okay. And can we um, print it to a PDF? Oh, yes, definitely, for sure. Uh, because this is a requirement that was actually brought up by one of our customers. When they had the external auditors come in to do their audits, they would want to take reports away with them. And um, so we added that functionality to print the reports to PDF. Okay, any other question? Um, that is it for now. Oh, thank you very much, Christine. So thanks again, everyone, for joining. Just to wrap up, I want to just go over the key takeaways from this webinar. And um, throughout the presentation, we touched on these points, just to recap. So case remount of 5.4.1, we enable compliance in more jurisdictions. So we added support for Dominican Republic. Significantly, we're reducing the workload on the compliance team by automating regulator reporting. And we continuously update the regulator reports to make sure that we are in tune with all the updates from the different um, regulators because we don't want a situation where persons are submitting their reports and these reports are being rejected because the system is not up to date. And lastly, we enable organizations to maintain compliance by uniquely identifying customers because if you're not able to uniquely identify a customer, then you will not be certain in terms of what activities those customers are performing or, or are involved in, or you won't be able to tell their risk score. Um, that's pretty much it. For the presentation, I just uh, want to thank you guys for um, lending, lending us your time today. And I hope you found it very informative. And uh, once again, I just want to say thanks again for, from the entire Caseware team. Have a good afternoon.